Well, good morning, and welcome this morning to our morning service. And it's great once again to be together this morning. And as we open, let's pray together. Father, we, we lift this time to you now, Lord. We pray that you would be with us as we spend time around your word, as we spend time in song, as we hear our kids talk, as we hear from your word. Lord, we pray that you would guide us now. Amen. Well, we have our normal events going on this week. We have our evening service this evening where we continue on through 1 Samuel to look at the story of, of David and Saul. And then uh, every day of the week we've got our Bible time with Auntie Liz. We have our Pebbles story on Tuesday morning on, on the Pebbles Facebook page. And then we have our Bible study on Wednesday night. Uh, we started last Wednesday a new study in Ruth for the next few weeks in the run-up to summer. So do come and join us if you can. We're going into chapter 2 of Ruth on Wednesday night. And then on Thursday, we're going to have a very special day. Andy and Chloe will be getting married on Thursday. Now we're going to have a, a small, very small wedding at the church. It'll just be the marriage ceremony, just to get them married. And then when all of these things are over, we'll be able to celebrate together. We'll be able to come together and have a proper wedding where we can celebrate with Andy and Chloe. But do be praying for them as they prepare for Thursday, uh, a time where they'll be able to come together and become husband and wife. So do be praying for them there. And then on Friday, we have our youth night with our teenagers. It's a very fun night. We've been having a lot of fun with them <clears throat> over the last few weeks. Lots of games and talks and time to interact with them. So thank the Lord that, that so many are coming along to this event. But also be praying that, that these young people would hear something of God's word in these meetings. And then we'll be meeting together again next Sunday to continue through Acts in the morning and then David will be leading us in the evening next Sunday. So do be praying for all of those events, do be praying for all that is going on over the next week. Well we're going to sing together in a moment and then we'll have our children's talk and children's song, our prayer and reading and then we'll come back together to spend time in the second half of Acts 17. So let's sing together. you 
Hello children. Are you any good at counting? I expect you are. Do you use your fingers to help you? Can you count up to five? One, two, three, four, five. Well done. I expect some of you can even do that in Welsh, can't you? Should we try again? In, die, tree, pedwar, pimp. Amazing. And I know that some of you are very, very clever indeed and can count and do all sorts, which is wonderful. But when we're looking at our little page in our book today, everything a child should know about God, we only need to count to one. You just need one finger. Can you do that? Even the very, very little ones. Can you show me one finger? Gabriel was one last week. I expect he can do this. One. Let's see what it says. John was teaching in the church Sunday school. Here he is, look. There's John. And there's his Sunday school class. Oh, aren't they sitting nicely? They're very well behaved, aren't they? And John said to the children, How many gods are there? And all the children told him, There's only one God. That's right, said John. Some people think there are many gods, but there is only one. And it's true, you will hear adults talking and you will hear when you go to school that there are maybe many gods, but there aren't. There's only one God. He is the maker of the universe. And even if we can't count at all, we can absolutely count on God. He is the designer of the dinosaurs, mapper of the ocean floors, and the one who sent his one and only son to die on the cross. And that way, in believing in him, we can have a place with that one God in heaven. So I'm so happy that there's only one God. How many gods are there? Just one. And all the glory and all the honour and all the praise belong to that one God. We're going to sing now. And it's a song that some of you know and some of you maybe don't. So sing up if you know it and give all praise to that one God. Thank you. Bye-bye. You have no birthday You have always been You alone have no beginning And no middle and no end You're always with me You are everywhere Jersey or in Egypt, even outer space, you're there. Everything you are and do is unbelievable but true. You're the God of wow, amazing. How could this be? You're the God of wow, you're more than I could ever, ever dream. The more I learn about you, exclamation points abound to the God of wow. You're never needy, how could you be? You made everything on earth and in the sky and in the sea You're never lonely, the Trinity Father, Son and Holy Spirit, yet you're reaching out to me Inviting me to come to you, inconceivable but true God of wow, you're more than I could ever, ever dream. The more I learn about you, exclamation points abound to the God of wow. I can't find the words that could be big enough, loud enough. 
there could be no song that I could sing enough or shout enough when I want to praise your name but don't know how I just say wow amazing how could this be and I say wow you're more than I could ever ever dream the God of wow amazing how could this be you're the God of Down to the God of Wow! Designer of the dinosaurs Mapper of the ocean floor Of all the wilds below above The best of all is your great love Well, good morning. Let's all pray. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning to uh, praise you, to worship you, to lift up our hearts, O oh Lord, in uh, thanksgiving to you, our God and our Father. We thank you for every blessing that is ours in Christ our Saviour. We thank you for him. We thank you for the one who gave himself for us, that uh, we might have new life, uh, that we might be forgiven, that we might be restored to you and to uh, know the, the grace and the mercy that you desire us to experience as your children. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for forgiveness for our sins, so many sins, O oh Lord, that have been washed away by that precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that we are cleansed and renewed and restored in him. Thank you for that righteousness that uh, we are clothed in now as your dear children we thank you that we stand before you uh, lord that you look upon us not in our unrighteousness in the filthy rags of our sins but we thank you father that you look upon us now in that perfect righteousness of the lord jesus christ cleansed and uh, restored in him so, Father, we bless you and praise you for your great grace to us day by day. Thank you, Father, for this day and for the opportunity that we have of meeting together, Lord, even though we're in our own homes. We thank you that we can come together to worship you and to praise you. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us and uh, draw near to us and be with us. Bless us, Lord, uh, as we uh, hear your word preached. We pray for Ben that you'll help him and strengthen him and speak through him this morning and this evening and that your word will come to us with power with authority and uh, help us O oh lord to apply it in our lives and to work it out from day to day we pray heavenly father for uh, all the various activities taking place this week and we pray lord that you will uh, be in each uh, activity and uh, from the youngest to the oldest, O Lord, that you would uh, bless and encourage and strengthen each one we ask. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that uh, you are watching over us and keeping us and sustaining us even through these difficult days. And uh, uh, we pray for one another, Lord, pray that your love uh, will be in our hearts. Pray, Lord, that we'll be uh, caring for one another and uh, lifting each other up before you uh, in prayer. Uh, we pray, Father, for those who are sad, for those who are mourning, for those, Lord, who are uh, struggling with uh, difficulties in their family lives, perhaps, or in their relationships. We pray, Heavenly Father, for uh, those who uh, have uh, other worries and concerns upon their hearts and minds. Lord, be with each one, we pray. Comfort, strengthen and encourage and uh, lift up uh, those who are downcast and uh, give them that sense of your nearness and your presence. Be with those in work, O oh Lord, watch over them and uh, protect them and be with them, we pray. Uh, and we pray for our children who will be going back to school this week, Lord, watch over them and 
bless them and uh, help them Lord as they uh, return to their classrooms and uh, uh, keep them safe uh, we ask. We thank you Heavenly Father for uh, uh, for uh, your grace uh, towards us and uh, Lord we are mindful O oh Lord of the uh, the uh, needs of uh, many in our land at this time Lord we pray that you will be uh, working out your purposes uh, through your church for the the good of your uh, of, uh, of this land and for the good of your people we pray Heavenly Father that you will continue to be with our leaders and those Lord who have responsibility in terms of uh, leading the country through this time of uh, uh, of the pandemic and uh, we pray Lord that uh, there will be uh, soon uh, uh, an opportunity uh, for us to uh, to be able to meet together as churches and to uh, to be uh, in our uh, in our buildings once again and to have the uh, the normality of uh, our services once more. So Lord, help us we pray and uh, continue to uh, help all those who uh, are, are working uh, out uh, policies and approaches through this, uh, uh, through this time we pray. Father we uh, thank you again uh, that uh, uh, you have uh, uh, been with us and kept us and sustained us Lord. Uh, even through the uh, the ups and downs of uh, of our isolation, but uh, Lord, we continue to pray that you will uh, sustain us and uh, uh, work in us, Lord, uh, spiritual life and uh, work out through us. We pray uh, what uh, you desire uh, that will bring glory and praise and honour to you. So, Lord, uh, hear us now and uh, be with us through the rest of this service this morning, we pray. And uh, we commit the whole day uh, into your hands and pray that you will, uh, we, that you will be glorified. Uh, wherever uh, your people are meeting together in this way, Lord, uh, we pray that your word will come powerfully into the hearts of your people uh, and that you will be praised and magnified and glorified. So hear us now and continue with us, we pray. And we ask all these things in that uh, lovely, precious name, the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Acts 17, verses 16 to 34. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, What is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they, are, they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth, 
and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, We want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus. Also a woman named Damaris and a number of others. Well, thank you for that reading. Well, in a moment, we're going to be looking at Acts 17, verses 16 through to 34 together. And we're going to be thinking about the idea of how we interact with the world. And we're going to be thinking about that in light of all that we've just heard from Acts. But before we do that, let's pray together. Father, we pray that you would be with us now. Lord, we pray that you would guide me as I lead us through these words. Lord, we pray that you would speak into our hearts from your word this morning. Father, we thank you for these great stories of the early church. We thank you for Paul's work in this second mission. Lord, we pray that you would guide us as we think on these things, Lord. Amen. Well, do keep your Bibles open in front of you while we look at these, these words together this morning. As we think about this, this thought, how do we interact with the world? Now when we think about interactions, we, we think about our ability to communicate with other people. And there are many ways in which communication can be stunted by the way that we act and the, the things that are going on in our lives. Things like stress and out of control emotions, lack of focus, inconsistent body language or negative body language can really damage communication and relationships. These things can cause big issues in a, in a wide range of relationships as well. Marriages can fall apart due to poor communication between husbands and wives. Workplaces can fall into disarray if colleagues cannot interact together well. Even families can descend into arguments if communication is poor. But these interpersonal relationships are not the only ones that rely on good communications to flourish. The church's relationship with the world around us relies heavily upon an ability to be clear and concise in our communication. Just as there's a list of things that, that show us poor communication, well, there's also a list of things that show us good communication and how we should speak with one another and communicate. We must listen as we interact with the world. We must pay attention to the things that are being said to us. We must be careful about how we interact with other people. But we need to be assertive in the things that we think. One of the big problems that the church has had historically when it comes to our interaction with the world around us is that we have been poor at spreading our beliefs well. The things that the Bible say are twisted by a whole range of different people. And so the world begins to think that we are hateful, small-minded, aggressive, rather than loving, open, welcoming. In this passage this morning, we see Paul in Athens. And after last week, we know that he's currently on his own while he awaits his companion's arrival from Berea. He knows that he is called to tell people about Jesus. 
He knows that that's been his mission. And with that call, he knows that he needs to make sure that the way that he interacts with other people is one filled with good and clear communications. And with the Lord flowing through all of the things that he does. And so as we examine Paul's time in Athens, we begin by seeing the trouble that impacts communication. Now the church is faced with trouble across the world daily. Members of the worldwide church are oppressed because of their beliefs. Some can't work because they stand for Christian values. One of the biggest troubles that the church faces in this day and age is that of cultural Christianity. This is something that, that impacts us in this country, but even more so across in the States, where there's still a major push of the label Christian rather than actual Christian living. The trouble is seen in the way that people claim that label. When they fill in a questionnaire, maybe they tick that box that says, well, I'm a Christian because, well, they go to church on Christmas Day and Easter. And so that makes them a Christian. Or my parents are Christians. So, yeah. Cultural Christianity causes the world to misunderstand what Christ Christ truly taught. <clears throat> when people call themselves Christians, but act in ways that are anything but Christian, the world thinks we're all like that. Paul is heading into a place where the word Christian is seen as dangerous. He'll be coming face to face with people who, just like on his previous missionary trips and in the rest of this chapter already, will think that his teaching is heresy or attempts to subvert the way that life is for them. And so as he goes to speak to them about God, he needs to ask God to guide him as he interacts with the world. We see as we open this section this morning that Paul is waiting for his friends. But as he waits for them, as he sits in Athens, he looks around, he sees the way everything is, and he can no longer keep quiet. He needs to speak about Christ because of all that he sees. As Paul sailed to Athens from the sea near Berea, he came to a city he'd probably never been to before. And like any tourist, he was ready to be impressed by the famous and historic Athens which hundreds of years before was one of the most glorious and important cities in the world. But when Paul toured Athens, he seems to only be depressed by the magnitude of the idolatry that he sees, because the city is full of idols. They all look up to some kind of statue for their needs to be fulfilled. Paul saw the beauty of Athens, but he sees that there's no honour to God in any way that they are acting here. And so he feels he has to do something. We can see this in our world now just as clearly. We can look around at the great works of technology, the ability we have to spend time together even though we cannot meet. We can marvel at it. We can see how great the internet is and see the great ways it's been used to spread the word of God. But alongside that, we see the way it is used to dishonor God. And we should feel called to speak out about it. To call people to see their true need, and not the need that can be fulfilled by, by any worldly thing. So he reasons in the synagogue, just as he has in the past. He sees the trouble in the city. He feels called to face it both on the Sabbath, in the synagogue, but also, as we see this time, slightly differently, in the marketplace, day by day, with anyone that happens to be there. Paul faced a challenging audience in Athens. It was a cultured, educated city. It was a city with a proud history. It was an intellectual powerhouse, much like Oxford or Cambridge. Paul spoke to a city perhaps different than any other city he had preached in before. And Williams notes, by now the greatest days of Athens were behind it, 
but it could still be fairly described as the intellectual capital of the Greco-Roman world. And at times it was also seen as the religious capital of Greece. This was a huge deal to preach in this city, to meet with these people. This was not like anything he had faced before. But he still felt called to preach, day by day, with anybody there. And let's see, we've got a group of Epicureans and Stoic philosophers interested in debating him. There are many different kinds of people in this city, and now we see Paul come up against these two groups. The Epicureans pursued pleasure as the chief purpose in life. They valued most of all the pleasure of a peaceful life. Free from pain, disturbing passions, and superstitious fears, including the fear of death. They did not deny the existence of gods, but they believed that, that they had nothing to do with them. They had a view that many hold today. A view that religion simply gets in the way of the fun side of life. And the Stoics, well, they believed that everything was God. And God was in everything. They believed that all things good or evil, were from God. So nothing should be resisted. They believed there was no particular direction or destiny for mankind. They were willing to follow any way they felt led. They felt that all things were coming from God and that meant that all things were absolutely fine. And once again, that's similar to many of the thoughts in today's world, isn't it? This idea that we should follow one's emotions our feelings. And they surely can't be wrong because, well, that's just what happens. They looked to debate him as he brought this teaching to the city, a teaching that was very different to all the things that they had thought in the past. And some of them, they, they reject what he's saying. They mock him as someone speaking nonsense. It's very interesting to look back at the things that, that Paul comes up against in these early years of the church. Many of the troubles that we face today with the world come from a belief that they think that they know better, that their views on seeking pleasure should be followed. And here we see that this view that we face now is not a new one. It is one that has been around in this time as well, with Athens. It's been in human history for thousands of years. People think this is New Age thinking, but it's simply very old pagan thinking. So we should see how Paul interacts with the world with a very similar way of thinking to the world of today. They mock him. They question him. They say, well, Paul's preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Isn't that just a foreign God? He teaches them the truth of Christ. In these debates, he doesn't shy away from his core message. Even in response to all that he is facing, he knows what is important. And so he preaches it. And as we see in verse 21, this region loved to think and debate. And so, they took him to the Areopagus, a place where there would be debate. They loved new ideas, fresh thinking. And this was, was why Paul got brought there, why Paul earned a meeting with these key thinkers. Clark says, in, uh, in the early 19th century, Clark described the situation of his day, and it sounded like it's even truer of our time. He said, this is a striking feature of the city of London in the present day. They itch for news, which generally argues a worldly, shallow or unsettled mind. And that itch is wonderfully prevalent. Even ministers of the gospel, negligent of their sacred function, are becoming, in this sense, Athenians. So that the book of God is neither read nor studied with half the avidity and spirit as a newspaper. It is no wonder if such become political preachers and their sermons be no better than the husks for swine. To such the hungry sheep look up and are not fed. That was the thoughts of a thinker in the early 19th century. 
and it's the trouble that we face today. As we think about interacting with the world, there is a great danger that we fall into the trap of becoming too interested in the things of man. It can impact the way that we think when it comes to God. We need to continue on, as Paul does in this passage, to speak of Christ in spite of the world's views. We shouldn't be swayed by worldly thinking to change what the Bible says. And Paul doesn't allow that to happen here, does he? He goes in to, a, to an area that is full of big thinkers, smart people, lots of different ideas. And he doesn't tweak the gospel of Christ's death and resurrection to fit into their way of thinking. No, he lays that out plain and simple. He knows that they need to hear that, and we should know that too. We should hold firm to that. Whatever physical troubles Paul had faced in the past, now he came up against the trouble of the Bible looking like a novelty to these people. He needed to keep hold of the truth of Christ and the great news of his death and resurrection. And we too must do this. As we interact with the world, it's important that we listen, that we take note of the things that are important to the world, but it shouldn't change the message of Christ. The moment that we change what the Bible says to fit the current world is the moment that we no longer teach the truth. We're called to speak the truth of the Bible constantly, without hesitation. At times, it's possible for us to look at the worries of the world and then point people to the Bible from those worries. But it should never change the truth of the Bible. And as we continue, we get to see firsthand the way in which Paul deals with the issues that he is facing. As we see in verses 22 to 28, well, the teaching. The author, Clifton Fadiman, once said, The great teacher is rarely popular. He is interested in something more important than winning the affection of an unending, anonymous procession of young people. Now, he's speaking about teaching in a classroom, the importance of being a good teacher to young minds, but, but that's also true when it comes to teaching people about God. We shouldn't be looking to win the affections of other people. We're talk the people we're talking to should instead be just taught the truth. We should be interested in them coming to a true faith in Christ. One based on facts rather than a message that has been edited to be more palatable to the masses. Paul knew this and he never strayed from the truth of Christ regardless of the people he was faced with. As we continue through this passage we get to see the way in which he taught these academics. And we'll see the message and how it is no different to that which he's taught in many other places. Paul begins as he has in the past. He looks at where they currently stand. They are religious. In some ways, they have religion running through their thinking. In this, he seems to commend their open mind to the other worlds, the, the other worldly things. Yet he also will explore how religion is not always right, how there's a problem with being religious as a title. Now there's a poem about this kind of issue that was made back in 2012. It was called, Why I Hate Religion But Love Christ. It was a very interesting poem. It brought about interesting thoughts regarding how religion is not the thing that we should be following. In the poem, uh, there's a little excerpt here for you. See, one's the work of God, but one's a man-made invention. See, one is the cure and the other the infection. See, because religion says do, Jesus says done. Religion says slave. Jesus says, Son, religion puts you in bondage while Jesus sets you free. Religion makes you blind, but Jesus makes you free. 
And that's why religion and Jesus are two different clans. Religion is man searching for God. Christianity is God searching for man. That's the problem here in Athens. They're keen to look to religion, but they're lacking to see the thing that actually saves them. And so Paul looks to teach them about Christ, the one that they need. Not religion, but Christ. He says to them, I walked around your city. I saw how amazing it was. But I also saw the way you worshipped the idols. He took examples from their culture so that he could speak with them on their terms. He said, I even saw that statue, that altar to an unknown God. Paul understood that in their extensive pantheon, the Greeks had an unknown God who covered any God that they might have neglected. Paul wanted to reveal the identity of that unknown God. With all this talk of being religious, what we see is that really, well, they were superstitious. They worried about what might happen if they forgot to praise one of the gods. Similarly, in some ways, to the way that these people believe, there's superstition now, isn't there? Touch wood. Don't walk under ladders. Bad luck will be brought on you if you do that. Don't break a mirror. Or even those who simply believe in some kind of spirituality in the world, while missing that Christ is the one that they should be focused on. Paul looks at their society. He sees what they're lacking. And he wants to teach them about it. He says, you're ignorant of the very thing you worship. But let me tell you who it is. Let me explain to you who God is. And then you can worship him properly. And so he takes them right back. He takes them back to the beginning. They had their statues to the unknown God. But but Paul said, let me make him known to you. Let me show you who he is. And start says, in explaining God to them, Paul starts at the beginning. God, the creator. We, his creation. This view of the world is very different from either the Epicurean emphasis on a chance combination of atoms or the virtual pantheonism of the Stoics. Paul recognized that these philosophers had to change their ideas about God. They had to move from their own personal opinion to an understanding of who God is according to what he tells us about himself in Scripture. It's the same call that we are to make to the world. They have the chance to get to know God in the Bible. And so we need to call them to do it. To learn of him. To see who he is. He says God doesn't live in man-made houses. He doesn't need to be fed. He doesn't need provisions from man. He is the one who provides. He created all things. He's not like the Greek gods who who required things of man. He didn't need people to bring their money. He didn't need people to physically feed him. Not like their gods, who needed things from the people to make sure that they were appeased. But he doesn't stop there. He speaks about where all people came from. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. Now, the Athenians, they believed that they literally sprung from the land, that land. They saw themselves as unique and special individuals. So they wouldn't marry outside of their land because they didn't want to muddy up who they were. Yet Paul wants them to know the truth of creation. All come from God. God not only creates all, but he planned all. He set the boundaries in place. Look at how Paul speaks to these Greeks. He's clear. He's building on what they already know and wants to point them to Christ from that. 
And he tells them that God did all of these things so that you would seek him. Perhaps you would reach out to find him. He wants them to see that God is the creator. He isn't an unknown God. He doesn't need to be sacrificed because you just don't get who he truly is. He is a God you can seek out. He is a God you can get to know. He's not hidden away. He is the one who can be known. And as people in the world today look into the things of the world, they they wonder, like, what kind of being would do this? Or how did these things come about in this exact way? Well, we should use those things. We should call them to exploration, to examine the scriptures alongside the questions that they have and seek out God. We should build on the questions that this world already has as we interact with them. Because there's news for these people. In God, we live and move and have our being. He says, we are his offspring. Now, these are two quotes that Paul uses, not from himself, but from Greek poets. They're attributed, respectively, to Epimendes, the Cretan, in 600 BC, who Paul quotes again in Titus 1, and Aratus in 310 BC. Paul didn't quote these men because they were prophets or because their teaching was of God. He quoted them because their specific words reflected a biblical truth. And by using them, he could build a bridge to this pagan audience. They would have known these quotes. And so he uses their thinking to point them to God. Paul, throughout this teaching session, gives an insight into how we should speak to those out in the world. The people that he is speaking to here are spiritual to their core. They have a religiousness about them. They believe in gods. They see spirituality as a real thing, but they miss that God can be known. They haven't seen that that God is one, that they're just part of his plans. So Paul begins by taking them all the way back to the beginning of all things. He wants them to see where they have come from so that they will know where they should go next. He's clear and concise when he speaks to these people, building on what they already know. He builds on their ideas of an unknown God and tells them that there is only one who can be known. He builds on their beliefs of their creation to point to the sole creator of all. He builds on their eagerness to explore spiritual things, to tell them to search for God. For he is the God who can be known. We need to look at the way that Paul teaches here and take some of these things on board in the way that we speak to the world. No one's expecting you to to have the elegance of speech that Paul has here or the confidence in the big things that he speaks on. But we all have the Bible. We all have the truth about God in front of us as we sit here with open Bibles. So we should take that to people. We should be clear about the things that the Bible says and we should build on the things that people already know or think. For example, when someone looks at the amazing beauty of nature, marvels at the way in which it has come about, we can build on it by taking them to Genesis. Seeing the beauty and the creator. Paul has faced off against the trouble of Athens here. He's begun to interact with the people by teaching them. And as we close the passage, well, we see a continuation of that teaching. And we see him show them in verses 29 to 34 the truth. Honesty is a key component of a healthy relationship. Not only because it helps us avoid harmful breaches of trust, but because it allows us to live in reality as opposed to fantasy and to share that reality with someone. Now this is just as true when it comes to our relationships with people, 
in the world. When it comes to telling people about God, it's important that we tell them the truth. If someone asks us about our biblical beliefs on a hot topic issue, and we look to appease them by telling them half-truths or, or our opinions on the matter, what will happen when they come face to face with the truth of the Bible? Well, they'll begin to question everything else you've said. Their relationship with people within the church will be damaged because we were not honest with them in the first place. Or worse yet, they will head down a route of believing something that is of man and not of God. Paul knows the danger of people following false truths. He was faced with that trouble of people thinking that he was a god, if you remember, in his first missionary trip. And so as he speaks with these people in Athens, he knows he must be honest with them about everything. And so he builds on all that's been spoken about already. He's spoken about creation, their relationship with God, and now he concludes with the truth of God. Paul's told them of God, and so now they know who he is. He is not made by man. Stott says the Athenians have acknowledged in their altar inscription that, that they are ignorant of God. And Paul has been giving evidence of their ignorance. And now he declares such ignorance to be culpable. There's a trouble if you know that there is a God and you ignore him. In the past, he says, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people elsewhere everywhere to repent. The truth is now that they've heard. They've heard the message of God and they have to respond. Paul went from knowing who God is, our creator, to who we are, his offspring, to our responsibility before him, to understand him and to worship him in truth and finally to our accountability if we dishonour him, judgment. There would be no excuse for them. Just as there's no excuse for people on earth now. Anyone who has heard of Jesus has to make a decision. There will be no way that they can say that they didn't know him. Even if they feel as though they haven't accepted or rejected him. The hard truth is that if we don't accept him as our king, by default we rejected him. As we thought about a few weeks ago, there are no half measures. You're either for him or you're against him. There's no middle ground at all. And this is a call for everyone. These words of Paul in verse 30, repent. Not work harder at making up for your sins, repent. Because he has set a day. Judgment is coming. And on that day, Jesus will judge. Now he brings not only the truth of judgment, but also of Christ to them. And he speaks about this truth and the proof of who Christ is through Christ's death and resurrection. The emphasis on the resurrection here is important. Paul saw the resurrection of Christ as the assurance of this. It demonstrated that Jesus himself, his teaching and his work, were all perfectly approved by the Father. But when they hear this, when they hear of the resurrection, it's not easy for them to hear. Boyce says all Greeks thought that man was composed of spirit, or in, in mind, which was good, and matter, or the body, which was bad. If there was to be a life to come, they thought that they didn't want it cluttered up with a body, but simply just the mind. Now the important thing that we should know about speaking to the world is that when the truth about Jesus comes out, well there'll be one of two ways that they respond to that truth. Some will respond like those in verse 32, the first group. They'll reject the words that we say. They'll sneer at us. 
because they don't want to hear the truth. They will be like those who reject Christ because they'd much prefer to rule their own lives or because they feel as though they're good enough to make it to heaven. After all, they never killed anyone. But others will act like those in the second half of the verse. Just like those in Berea responded, they will be interested. They'll want to know more about these new ideas. They'll continue to explore the truth with them. And we are called to teach them. Paul knew what he wanted to speak about. It was Jesus and his death and his crucifixion and his resurrection. But people mocked him. When they wanted to speak about Greek theology, well, what does he do in verse 33? He leaves. He gave them the chance. He spoke about Christ, and those who mocked him would much prefer to think on the intellectual things of the world. But he leaves. He doesn't leave those who are keen. So follow him. They'll continue to hear more about this Christ, this one who was resurrected. And we see the Son believe. And a church begins to grow here, doesn't it? We've got Dionysius, the member of the Areopagus, and Damaris, that woman, and a number of others who come together in faith. Boy, he says, yeah, Paul's sermon here was eminently biblical. Like the biblical revelation itself, his arguments begin with God the creator, and they end with God the judge of all. The speech as it stands admirably summarizes an introductory lesson to Christianity for cultured pagans. The truth that he teaches is a good baseline message, isn't it? It's the truth that everyone needs to hear. And from that, we're shown how to speak to the world as we evangelize. And we see the result. The fact that God will work whether it be in big ways of thousands of people coming, or whether it be in small ways, where a small church meets together and begins to grow in this area. But we get to see these people growing in love for one another. It starts as we learn from Paul that we cannot preach the gospel of Jesus without the doctrine of God, or the cross without the creation, or salvation without judgment. We must speak the truth as we go about interacting with the world. We must follow this example of Paul. He doesn't shy away from telling people about the one God, about the plan of salvation that has been worked for his people. So as we think about how to interact with the world, we must take our examples from Paul. Speak to the people as he spoke to the Athenians. The people in Athens, with their beliefs in many different gods, their love of knowledge, their superstitions, are probably some of the most relatable people that we see in the New Testament to the people that we meet in our day-to-day -day lives. We're called to go out into the world, tell people of Christ. We're shown the way in which we should go by telling them Christ through his time on earth. And how we should take these things to people. We should go knowing that we will face trouble. We will come up against people who don't want to hear what we have to say. Don't want to accept anything that we have. We'll meet people who in fact are directly opposed to our views. But when we meet those people we should go about introducing them to the teachings of the Bible. We should do that by basing everything we say upon God and upon the things that they already think they already know we should show them the way in which God has worked amazing things in the world including the creation and the redemption of a people and finally well we should never shy away from the truth the truth of God's love but also the truth of judgment the great trouble that people will find themselves in if they do not come to Christ, asking him to be the king of their lives.
We must interact with the world. We must take them to the Bible and ask God to work, to use us, to grow his kingdom upon this earth while we live for him. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for the way that you work, Lord. And we pray as we think of how we talk to the world, we pray that you would watch over us. That you would give us guidance on, on how we speak to people, Lord. That you would give us opportunities to tell people of your great workings in history. The great wonders that you have done, Lord. We pray that you would help us. That you would watch over us in the troubles of the world. That you would guide us in the teachings. That you would continue to use us to point to the truth. Amen. Well, let's just sing our closing song together. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time where we can meet again. We thank you for your word, for the way that you speak through your word into our hearts, Lord. And we pray that you would challenge us now with this in the way that we speak to people in the world. We pray that you would give us opportunities to speak your name out to people as we meet them, Lord. Father, we pray you would bless us now. You would keep us and you would bring us back together again soon. In your name, amen.
Thank you for joining us again this morning and hopefully we'll join again together tonight. God bless.